Sure. Hello and welcome. Every, good afternoon, everyone. We're, uh, we're pleased to spend this time with you today. We're completely thrilled to be able to, to speak about how accessibility dr can drive innovation and more importantly, how we can bring hearing devices and hearing healthcare to populations that otherwise wouldn't have access. I'm Daryl Adams, and I'm the Director of Accessibility at Intel, and I'm here with Jason Solomeyer, who is the founder and CEO of 3DP for Me. 3DP for Me is a US-based uh, technology not-for-profit that is operating out of Jordan. Today, we also were to be joined by Michael Hart, at, a general manager at Accenture, but he had tested positive for COVID earlier in the week, and so he was unable to travel. So we are gonna mix this up a little bit today. And so I'm going to start by spending a little bit of time just setting context around disability and accessibility. And then Jason's gonna really dive into the, the collaboration that we have between Intel, Accenture, and 3 dp for me around the Hearing Express pilot project. We think, um, and at that point, we will invite Marina from Lantos Technologies on stage to do a, a live demonstration of the, the ear scanning process that we'll be talking about today. And then after that, we're going to basically turn this into more of a panel discussion with Marina as well. So the three of us will be here to answer direct questions from the audience. So I'd appreciate if, as you're listening today, um, definitely queue up the questions and we'll be really happy to, to spend a little bit of time at the end uh, having more of a conversation. So to get started, I, I do, I, I wanna talk about accessibility and sort of the disability context and how technology can, can really create, how we can use technology to create a future where it is inclusive to, for everyone. Disability is a big deal. There are roughly 17% of the population around the world is, has experiences some form of disability. That's over 1.3 billion people. When we think about disability, we can be talking about blindness or people that are, have some level of visual impairment, people who have motor mobility impairments, quadriplegic, or even just tremor and different types of dexterity uh, challenges, cognitive impairments, neuro, neurological impairment. So, with, so this is a super large population. And we, when we think about the breadth of that, of that disability um, community and how, in the, thinking about th through how we can use technology to serve the needs of, the, of, of this community. When we think about those numbers, they're, they're significant. And if you kind of put your business hat on, people would say, well, this is a great market opportunity. And indeed, it is a fantastic market access opportunity. But it goes far more, but the implications are far greater. Uh, if we think about how we can use, or basically, if we can reduce barriers for people with disabilities, technology barriers, we open doors. And in fact, we can open doors that have maybe never been opened before. We can open doors to education. We can open the door to career opportunities where somebody can gain employment and maintain employment and be contribute, positively contributing to the, to the economy and to society. That's a big deal. The, um, and if you think about that for one person, and then you just increase that to a million people, 10 million people, 100 million people, that is the power of disability inclusion at scale. And so now I want to shift gears and talk a little bit directly about accessibility. Accessibility is related to, but distinct from disability inclusion. Think of accessibility as the design of products and uh, environments and experiences that really are able to uh, 
that allow everyone, that enable everyone to participate. And it's such a simple concept, just you know, enable products that everyone can participate. But we've historically done a really poor job at this. And so when we think about the accessibility industry today, the majority of the effort that goes into this work is around remediating poor design or, or design that wasn't thought through entirely that, in thinking about the entire population. So we spend a ton of time, um, like the context would be if in, um, in a physical setting, you may have to add a ramp where there were only stairs. In a digital setting, you may uh, have a software application or a web uh, experience that somebody who is blind can't access because it doesn't support a screen reader. And so we spend tons of time, tons of effort and money to go back and retrofit and remediate all of these scenarios. So I think as an industry, we can certainly do much better. And the way that we do this is through inclusive design and really bringing in people with disabilities from the very beginning of the design the thinking process. And then including those, those disability insights through the entire product life cycle. So we're talking about design into development, to testing, deployment. If we do this along the way, and we include that diversity of thought, then we make it, we essentially make better products. You, you make products that are available to more people and the products themselves are better. So why is Intel interested in embracing accessibility? So not only is this the right thing to do, but it really, we feel that we are uniquely positioned to really drive new accessible uh, experiences through a number of different technology uh, domains. Our CEO, Pat Gelsinger, has identified five different technology domains that really Intel is, uh, it, play, it plays a significant role. He calls them the five superpowers. Those superpowers are ubiquitous computing, so the idea that everything is becoming digitized and that's scaling out over time and so everything computes. The next is pervasive connectivity. So 5G, the idea that, and, and the reality that everything is connected to everything and that this notion of being offline or online is getting smaller and smaller. Um, then the, the third pillar or third superpower is the cloud to edge infrastructure. So we're, we're getting really smart about how we can move compute workloads closer to the user and to Im, Im, reduce latency, improve performance, and improve experience. The fourth pillar is artificial intelligence. And with machine learning, with a lot of the large language models that have been a lot of, a lot of press lately, computer vision, natural language processing, all of these concepts are really going to drive changes in the way that we interact with technology. The fifth superpower is sensing. So whether you have a smartphone that's jam-packed with sensors, you've got laptops that have sensors in the lids, you've got an environment that more and more frequently have sensors around us collecting information, we're collecting a tremendous amount of data about us. And how we use that as insights that can help our systems help us is, the, is part of this opportunity. One example, uh, also, if we think about each one of those pillars, these five pillars, every one of them is experiencing disruptive change. Like th this is nonlinear growth and incredible innovation. And you put these things together, more, one or more, or two or more of them together, it is, it's remarkable. Like, like the, th the, the opportunities that we have before us are, are incredible. We don't necessarily know what the future is going to look like, but we know that the future is not going to look like this. There's significant change ahead. And it's my goal that when that change, as that change occurs, that we're bringing everybody forward and that we're not creating or duplicating the, the errors of the past and designing for just the mainstream and not considering the, well, certainly the disability community. Um, 
A couple of examples of how, at least in the PC context, what this might look like in the, in the near future. If you consider a, a, a traditional PC experience and you're a low vision user who just basically can't read small, you know, the smaller font size, if the computer could know what that, exactly what that, what that user, what its user can see and what it cannot, and it also knows how far away from the screen they're sitting, it should always be, produce visuals and text on the screen that the user can see. There should be no such thing as something on the screen that you're trying to squint at and can't see, because it knows what you can see and it provides it to you. And especially, and, and even if you lean back, you're reading a document, you lean back in your chair, it should dynamically adjust because it knows what you can see. So oh, cool. And a, a, another example would be on the, the uh, being hard of hearing. If we know what you can and cannot hear, we can produce the sounds that you can hear and not produce the sounds that you can't. We can improve the quality of the voices because typically when you're hard of hearing, voice recognition or, or understanding words can be difficult. And so we can also enhance um, automated captioning over time that would allow for a platform level captioning experience that that's completes the, um, or captions every spoken word that comes across the system, regardless of the context of the application. And it would be low latency, highly accurate. And that way, that's, that, that's kind of a primary reinforcement of being able to understand what's going on on the computer, whether you're talking to somebody else or just listening to videos or whatnot. And going one step further, if you were deaf, Somebody who's deaf, we should be really asking, why can't you communicate with, a, with, a, with technology through sign language? Why can't you instruct a computer using sign language? Awesome. And why can't you receive that information back or you know, um, verbal information back with signs? We have all of that technology today or very close to having all of it. And it's just a matter of prioritization and will to make that happen. There's really no reason why we need to be limiting ourselves to keyboards, mice, and monitors to interact with technology. In fact, that is the, we are, well, lastly, I wanna definitely cover beyond the PC. So we're, we, we've been moving down this path to immersion, immersive computing. So we're talking about virtual, extended, uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, and then even things like voice assistance, interacting with technology outside of the sitting down in front of a computer and working at a desk. All of these opportunities, these experiences, have the, the potential to change the game for people with disabilities. And it could, that game can change both in terms of, and positively, by bringing people into that mix and making sure that everyone can, can, can participate or it could be negative in the sense that we, we forget about it and then they're, they're left out again. So we have to do, there's a lot of work to be done here in that arena to ensure that we are bringing everyone forward. But no matter what, what we can say is that we are changing the landscape and basically changing the relationship between people and technology. And probably importantly, we're also changing how technology can mediate the, co the connections between each other. So thinking about that, like how does technology get in, you know, basically enable people to communicate more effectively with each other? And that's really what we're talking about also today. So I want to turn it over to Jason now to talk to us more about our, the, the collaboration that we have between Intel, Accenture, and 3DP for me, and the, the program that we're driving, and then really kind of your vision on how this solution is going to help people who are hard of hearing actually be able to communicate and connect more effectively with others. Thank you so much, Daryl. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to stand up because I'm a stand-up kind of guy, uh, but I uh, I wanted to tell you a story, so. If you would close your eyes with me, I'm going to try to take you to a refugee camp in Jordan. So just close your eyes with me just for a minute and say, imagine that you and your family have lived 
in a refugee camp for 50 years. And you were born in the camp, and your five-year-old daughter was too. And you love your daughter with all of your heart. And you want the best for her to have a future and a hope and to thrive. Um, And you watch your daughter grow up, and you see that she has significant hearing loss. And you start to wonder, you know, how is she going to do in school? You see her struggle to communicate in the home with family and with friends outside the home. And she is just having a tough time. And you're thinking to yourself, how can I get access to a hearing aid when I can't even afford a taxi fare to an audiologist, let alone a hearing aid? And my daughter loves soccer, and she plays on the street every day with her friends. And several times, cars have raced by, and they almost hit her because she can't hear them coming. And you feel discouraged, saying, how how can I get access to a hearing aid? But what if there was access to a simple solution to a hearing aid for your daughter? How would you feel? And that's what brings me joy, because there are opportunities. One of the things that I was really fortunate to see was a man that I really admired. Um, His name's Andrew. And he was in Jordan for 45 years and just loved the people. And he did all the hearing aids in the Syrian refugee camp. If you can imagine with me, there was 2,000 people waiting for a hearing aid. And his production unit was amazing. You can imagine like an artist, and they take an impression of an ear, and they put it in plaster and heat it up, and then they fill it with silicone, and they tool it out by hand. And they do an incredible job. Like you would think that somebody would get an award for how much detail they can provide. But they can only make three or four in a day. And Andrew came to me and said, Jason, we got to figure out a way to bring technology into this solution so we can provide additional access to people, but also drive down affordability. And so that's that's kind of the journey that I've been on of discovery of what technologies are out there and how do we leverage them to provide more opportunities for kids and other people, adults, to hear. So one of the people I connected to was a gentleman named Dr. Brian Flagor. He is a Harvard audiologist, and he helped to bring to market an MIT technology that Marina, you'll see later, will demonstrate for us in the Lantos scan. So I won't steal her full thunder, but it's basically a balloon that goes in your ear and enables us to take a model, and we can take that model into a cloud setting and produce an STL file that we can print out on a printer in less than 45 minutes, we can have 10 to 15 ready to go. This allows us tremendous opportunity to scale and capacity. But in humility, we're still very early on. We're a startup company with the support of Intel and Accenture. We're we're hoping to provide 50 children with hearing aids in February. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. One of the things that went along with this was the story of building an ecosystem of partnerships. So we built partnerships in the audiology community with Asiga, they're one of the top 3D printing companies, the material company DTAX, and many others. We've also built great relationships in the 3D printing expert space, and we have tremendous volunteers. There's about 30 people worldwide that are helping us to bring this to life. And I'm just so thankful for each and every one of them. I, as we look into the future of our pilot, last Saturday we had the joy of doing our first free medical day in the camp. And 60 kids came. And it was just so much fun to see their faces and shake their hands. And and really after so many years of preparation, being able to interact with them just brought so much joy to my heart. And we are launching a next free medical day in December. We were able to find 20 kids out of those 60 that came that need hearing aids. 
We have another one when I travel back to Jordan uh, in December, and we're hoping to find 30 more to fill out our 50 that we need. But we're also building out our capacity. We built out a state-of-the-art facility that would enable us to have a technician to do all design. But we're, we're also looking at the future of, you know, we're gonna have our experts come to Jordan once we've identified our first 50 kids. Dr. Brian will come, as well as another 3D printing expert, Dominic, and he'll, he'll be able to take the 3D scans of the kids, and then we will do the production and fitting. Our partner on the ground is the Queen Newer Foundation. They have 450 staff. They have 20 loca 28 locations in Jordan. Seven of them provide hearing health care. And we're just a value add to them so that we don't have to recreate the whole wheel of service. And we're so thankful for what they do for us. And as we look ahead, we're looking to figure out how do we not only provide hearing aids, but we want to commit to each child that we're focused on initially for speech therapy. So we want to commit to maybe 20 speech therapy lessons because we know the child, even though he, gets a, he or she gets a hearing aid, that they need speech therapy to relearn how to speak and to produce sounds correctly. Uh, so we're trying to look at it from a holistic standpoint. Um, we're also looking at how do we train our staff and bring that technology transfer from foreign uh, parties into Jordan to train our local staff. Through the pilot, we, we want to also try to figure out what our cost basis is and understand how we can present that story to a potential funder to scale. And we're also looking at how do we build additional relationships in the country so maybe we can be a referral partner for humanity and inclusion or world vision or other people who are seeing people and maybe they don't have an option, option for hearing health care and we can maybe be a reference for them in the future. Um, we're also, our team, our partner team at Hack for Impact helped design a custom software that is based on the AWS platform and they did a fantastic job the first iteration. And we are going to leverage that to be able to pull the data up from the scan and also to make customizations. Because kids, it's like wearing a piece of, uh, like a shoe. A child, as they grow, they, they need a hearing aid mold quite frequently. Marina could speak to that better today. But I, I have heard it might be at every 6 to 12 months. So we want to be able to provide that follow-up care for them as they grow. Let me um, finish by saying, you know, as we look to the future, we realize that one of the bigger challenges is the lack of audiologists. So in the developing world, for instance, in North Africa, there are countries, there, there's, they don't have one audiologist to serve the whole country. And we know in order for us to scale, we're going to have to train up audiologists that would allow us to have the reach that we need. And we feel like that's a big bottleneck for us in the future, to be able to really uh, build up a team of people that have the talent and can go out and serve underserved communities. We're also looking at, with help from Intel and Accenture, potentially how do we leverage AI and how do we create efficiencies uh, through the model of taking the scan to the printer, an average technician takes somewhere between 10 to 12 minutes to prepare that file. So there's an opportunity in the future where we might be able to drive that time down and create some efficiencies. And when we look to a sustainable model, there's also funding involved. So we are looking at different funding models to see who would be able to participate and we know that once we show a successful pilot, then hopefully we can gain some additional traction with people that say, hey, I really want to participate in this and give the gift of hearing to other kids who don't have access. Um, so I, I will pause there um, and let me uh, introduce uh, Marina. So Marina is with the team at Lantos Technologies. She is amazing. She's an audiologist. And uh, why don't you come on up, Marina? 
She is going to do a demonstration with the Lantos uh, 3D ear scanner, and I'll let her take it from here. Thank you, Jason. So as Jason mentioned, thank you. Uh, my name is Marina, I'm with Lantos Technologies. I'm the senior uh, lead clinical trainer um, with Lantos. And what Lantos does is we're a 3D ear scanning company. Um, and uh, as Jason mentioned, we are able to use a membrane or it looks like a water balloon uh, to go into the ear and it maps over a million data points to construct a 3D model. Um, so it takes the place of this silicone uh, goop and it allows for a fully digital workflow, which is really advantageous um, to a company like 3DP for me. So what you're seeing on the screen here uh, on the left side is actually a live view from my scanner. And I invite everyone when we're done with our talk to come on up. I could show you uh, the scanner up close and personal and you could feel around um, and see how it works. Um, and then on the right side, it's kind of just guiding me on what to do. So I have it all prepped and ready for Daryl here. And I'm actually gonna come over to his left side because I'm gonna be scanning his left ear. And like I mentioned, this is a live view, so you can really see my fingerprint right there. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm gently going to place the membrane into Daryl's ear. So everyone's gonna be able to see the inside of your ear, Daryl. There it is. And that's his eardrum right there. And I'm actually using that yellow circle to get right up close and personal to within five millimeters of Daryl's eardrum. And I just pushed a button. And what's happening is the membrane is inflating with water, similar to a water balloon. And that membrane is now taking the shape of Daryl's ear. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fill up more of the membrane with that water solution while looking at Daryl's ear. And that's just to make sure I get it all up into every nook and cranny so that I can scan it and create that 3D model. So the way that the system captures images is very similar to a panoramic photo on an iPhone. So you're gonna see all kinds of fun colors pop up in a moment. White means I'm almost ready to start collecting data. And now that it's turned black, data has already started collecting. And what I do is I actually pan a camera that's inside all around, like a panoramic photo, nice and slow and steady. And anywhere the camera looks and captures those black markers, the 3D model is actually building in real time on the right side of the screen. I am actually guiding the camera through Daryl's ear. I'm entering the ear canal right now with that camera and just really collecting those little black markers off of every single surface. And the neat thing is I ended a little early because I can see black markers all the way to the end and that model has finished building. Then I click a button and everything retracts and I'm safely able to take it out of Daryl's ear. And once that finishes, we'll have the finished model on the screen. And I'm gonna turn it around for you guys so we can look at it together. And I'm gonna come around this way, so I'm not blocking you. So this is the finished model, the finished 3D image of Daryl's ear. So we've got his canal right here. So that's the inside part that we can't see with the naked eye from just looking at it. And then this is the outside part of Daryl's ear. So it captures every portion fully and we can create any product from a full um, in the ear device to something really, really small um, to help Jason with his, with his, uh, with his nonprofit. Um, and then as he mentioned, once you're done with the scan, it's as simple as just shooting it off to the cloud. And from the cloud, it can be pulled and designed and 3D printed. Awesome. Yep. That's, fantastic. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>